we're going to uh, do a series called Unexpected Stories. Because what makes a story so great is perspective. You know, you can hear a story one way, and, it, and it's cool, and you're like, I like that. But then all of a sudden, you put on like a different set of glasses. You look at the story just from a different perspective, and it changes everything. And all of a sudden, you realize how unexpected things are. Let me give you an example. We're from Florida. We now live in Wisconsin. In Wisconsin, this is what 50 degrees looks like. You know, it's such a long winter that by the time, the, by the time it hits 50 degrees, you're like putting on the shorts, putting on the tank tops, thinking about going swimming. I mean, you are just so excited. But no kidding, this is Florida, 50 degrees. <laughs> you know, yeah. when it's 80 degrees in February, and it really is, I mean, I'm not, I'm not joking, it's 80 degrees in February. When it hits 50, I mean, people are like pulling out the sweaters and the jeans. Some of the ladies are like, finally, I get to wear my boots, you know, and it's like, everybody's dressed up. Kids are going to school going, man, when's it going to get warm again? 50 degrees. It's all about perspective. It's all about the glasses that you wear, the way you look at things. And um, Bible stories are just the same way. You know, you think one thing's going on, but then... If you look behind the story a little bit, all of a sudden you start realizing there's some unexpected stuff that's just so cool. Well, that's what we're going to look at this summer, and I am, uh, I'm pumped about it. Today, we're going to be, you know, we're going to look at a lot of different stories, but today we're going to kind of look at the big picture, kind of the epic story of uh, God's story, because it is so epic. And then we're going to, in, in this, in today, we're going to kind of see that big picture so that as we look at the little individual stories throughout the Bible, you can kind of see where they fit. Because it's, it's kind of like how our story fits into God's story. You know, we each have one life. That was brilliant. You should write that down. We each have one life. Now, we can choose to live it for our little story. You know, the story that's all about us and about what we want and all that. Or... We can choose to be part of the grandest story of all time, the epic story of God. See, the choice is up to us. And, you know, it's not a one-time choice. It's a daily choice, hourly choice. Every, every moment we get the choice, do I do things my way or do I choose to participate in God's way where he's the lead? So today we're going to talk about that story, the epic story. Now, if you could sum up the entire Bible into just a few words. Here's, here's some words that I think it would be. It would start with creation. You know, first, first verse in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created everything. Now, let me ask, a little bit of audience participation. What do you love about creation? Like, what's your favorite part? Because I got to tell you, you're looking at a body of water like that out there, it moves me. I, I keep telling my wife, I could never get sick of that view right there. And we have, you know, we've been here for two weeks, woo you know, like <laughs> for a couple of days each week. It's been funny. But we drove all the way up to the tip of the peninsula, and thank you, and we drove all the way back down. And we were saying to ourselves, it's so funny, we started over in Sturgeon Bay and went up, how we didn't see a lot of beaches. We saw a lot of beautiful water, and we're like, but where, there's no beach, and then we hit Algoma, and we saw the, ten the, the, the tennis courts. No, they're volleyball courts. The volleyball courts out there, the weird coyotes that freaked us out that are on the sand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, because the first day we were here, it was windy, and we thought they were real because the, the tail was wagging and the head was doing this, and my daughter's like, what? But now we know. No, we don't know what they're for, but we know they're there, and they don't scare us. But you have, like, one of the most beautiful beaches that we have seen in, in Wisconsin, and it is beautiful, and I could look at it. So, sorry, back to you. What are some of your favorite aspects of creation? Flowers? Mountains? Stars. What else? Sunset, the sky. Fish. Eating them, looking at them, it doesn't matter, baby. <laughs> Sorry, my, I'm going to get this fixed. One day it will stop moving. Anything else? What do you love? My eyes. My, your, yours or just the fact that you have them? Absolutely. The fact that we can see. Out of all of creation, guess what God is most enthralled with? Isn't that cool? Because none of us said people. 
<laughs> I didn't hear one person, especially us dads, say my kids or, you know, nothing. <laughs> nothing. What's wrong? Um, no, I mean, we, you know, we look at beauty and we go, and, and when somebody said the stars, I'm like, in Florida, there's so many people that you never get to see the stars. We actually, I didn't know I had never seen the stars until I moved to Wisconsin and we were in Rice Lake up in the, in the North Woods. And that first night, I was astounded. I'm like, I can see the Milky Way. I, I didn't know it was there. I didn't. I didn't. I had never seen it. I, I was born in Miami. I, we moved to Central Florida near the Orlando area. That's been my home my whole life. I was blown away at the stars. And as amazing as that is to me, as amazing as that water is to me, God looks at us, and he loves it even more. He sees us as more beautiful than that. And, you know, I'll drive down the road and I'll get cut off by a jerk or I'll be the jerk who cuts somebody else off or anything. In the midst of all of that, God still sees something in us that is so beautiful. See, the creation story continues. God created everything, but then he created us. And it says in the Bible, he created in Genesis, male and female, he created them. And together, they reflected the image of God. Adam and Eve reflected the oneness, the community of God, Father, Son, Spirit, that when he looked at that couple, he saw something, some kind of image of himself. And while the surrounding peoples um, of, you know, like when, when Genesis and Exodus, all those was, when those were written, all of the surrounding peoples had so many gods who believed that their gods each ruled a part of creation. You had the storm god, you had the land god, the sea god, the blah, blah, you know, all the different gods. But the Genesis story revealed that there was only one god who created and ruled it all. One god. When the surrounding religions said that humanity was nothing more than tools to be used by the gods, the Genesis story shows that humanity, it reflects the image of God. Humanity was created with a purpose. See, in Genesis, creation meant oneness. Adam and Eve were one flesh. They were in perfect unity. They weren't just in unity with God, but they were in unity in, in oneness with themselves. They were in oneness with each other. They were in, in this oneness with the world around them. And all of this happened in the first two chapters of Genesis. Creation equals oneness. It was beautiful, and it was perfect. And what's so cool is God is so humble. He looked at all of this perfection and beauty, and he said, it's good. It's good. You know, we're like, we create an iPod or an I iPod. What year is this? I'm sorry. <laughs> We create an iPhone or a Galaxy or something like this, and we go, that is amazing. And God creates all of this, and he goes, it's good. It's very good. It's good. It's good. So he's humble. I don't know why I said that. Sorry. Then, so you have this perfection. But then came Genesis chapter 3. Because you see, Adam and Eve, they were created different from the rest of creation. See, human beings are different than all other creation. Angels dirt, you know, land, peop, uh, um, trees and animals and all that kind of stuff. Adam and Eve were created with the ability, they were, they were created with the ability to love God or reject him. And they were created with, with this thing in them that they are physical beings, you know, you can touch us, and, but we're also spiritual beings. We're both. It's like you have the spirit world here and you have this physical world here and they unite in one place, us. So we have this, this uncanny ability to reflect the image of God. We have this, this ability to choose, do we, do we follow, G, do follow God or not follow God? Sorry, I said Jesus, but he's, he comes a little bit later in this story. But, um, you know, we, do we follow God or do we choose to reject him? Do we participate in his story, the epic story, or do we focus on our story, the little story, my story? I'll try to use a high voice, that way, you know, you get it. And then some of you are like, he always has a high voice. What are you talking about? <laughs> so, unfortunately, Adam and Eve, they had these two choices, God's story or their story, and they chose the second. They chose otherness, and they chose brokenness. Because instantly, when they chose that, they, they experienced separation from everything. Everything. They were no longer content with themselves. They became controlled by their passions. 
And it says that um, they were no longer one with God. They realized they were naked and they hid from God. And they were embarrassed. They were no longer one with each other. And they began to blame each other. And forevermore, they would try to control each other. We see that every day. People trying to control each other. The world around them. They would fight against the land. They would abuse it. They would eventually die and be buried in it. See, we call this the fall. And it's what you and I experience every single day. It's why we do what we don't want to do and why we don't do the things that we want to do. I mean, it's so frustrating. It, it's the, the fall, this brokenness, this otherness is the reason that we wonder, does God even exist? It's, it's, it's why divorce happens. It's why abuse and abandonment happens. Because we are broken. We are separate. We are other. But here's the question. See, in the midst of brokenness and separation, how did God respond? What did he do? Because many of us just assume that God is mad and he's just angry all the time and he wants to judge us. Because that is how all of the gods that surrounded Israel, that's how all of them were. They were mad. We were just tools in their hand and if we did something wrong, they would punish us and judge us and do that kind of stuff. But see, that's not... Israel's God. You can read the story in Genesis 3. And that, yeah, they had to face the consequences of their choice. They did have to leave the Garden of Eden. They were going to die eventually. But God never yelled at them. God didn't abandon them. Read the story. It's fascinating. Because God pursued them. He called out to them. They were walk, you know, they, he was walk, it says he was walking in the garden. And they hid because they realized they were naked. And God reaches out to them. He calls out to them. And then he meets their needs. He gives them clothing. He protects them. He provides for them. See, the Bible begins by God creating and people rejecting. But then the rest of the Bible, from Genesis 5 all the way to Revelation 22, the entire Bible is about God seeking reconciliation. God seeking a renewed oneness. He is pursuing us so that he can restore us. So you have this this pursuit, this restored oneness. See, God knew we would reject him. He had a plan from the very beginning to offer restoration and wholeness. That was the plan. The entire Bible is the epic retelling of this story. There was creation, there was brokenness, and there, there was God pursuing us to bring renewed oneness, to restore us. That's the Bible. And that story continues towards the perfect redemption in the person of Jesus Christ. It is a story of God seeking us out and doing everything necessary to make us right with him. That's the story. That's the epic story that we're going to be talking about over and over this summer, looking at little stories within the big one. Because God wants to show us how much he loves us. He pursues us. He invites us to be a part of his grand story. So I wanted to share a little bit with you about how I've seen God pursue. Because when I look at my life, I can see this story continually playing out where I am broken and God pursues me. I didn't grow up in, in church. Um, that I actually was in high school when I first started going to church. And, but when I look back at my life, I can see how God put just the right people in my life at just the right times. Um, I, I remember I visited a youth group a couple of times because they like did some fun activities. That was why I went. And, uh, but I never really went to the weekly program that they had. But one of the youth leaders, his name was Stuart. I'm sorry, I'm going to fix this for once. Might make my ear turn blue, don't laugh. But um, Stuart was one of the youth volunteers, and he continually uh, visited me at football games that, that our school had. He was probably at every single game. And every time he saw me, which was every time, because later I found out he was always seeking me out, he would invite me back to youth group. And of course, I would always promise to come, with no intention of ever actually going, and I wouldn't. But then one day, he said, but we're having this event this Wednesday night, and I was like, oh, well, that sounds fun, and I went. And that night began a journey of me finding Christ, choosing to follow Christ, and um, it changed my whole life. See, at that moment, Stuart was the, were the hands and feet of Jesus to me. Stuart was the manner in which God pursued me. And he's still pursuing me. And he's pursuing you too. God is pursuing you. 
The Bible says, and you know this passage. If you watch any pro football, you've seen this on a sign. For God so loved the world. Who's the world? We are. Yeah, all people. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But that's what most people think. That God sent his son into the world to condemn the world because God is an angry God who doesn't really like us. <laughs> that's what people think, but that's not the truth at all. God loved us. He sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That is like a message that has gotten lost somewhere. God loves us and wants to save us, not condemn us. See, this offer of restored oneness, it's not just for good people. It's for us too in here. Just kidding. I know we're good too. God, it's not, you know, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what kind of person you've become. It doesn't matter. God loves you and he's pursuing you right where you are, right here, right now. He's inviting you to participate with him, inviting you to participate with us in this grand story of God. It's a story that plays out over and over. Now, in Genesis chapter 12, and I'm going to bump, we're, we're, we're going to get there. I mean, we're, I promise you, we're not going to be here longer than an hour and a half. So just <laughs> kidding, just kidding. In Genesis chapter 12, God started this new chapter of the story. He focused on a man named Abram, which you probably know better as Abraham. This is what God said to Abraham. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. But listen, here's the good part. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Genesis 12, we're talking the beginning of the story. From the very beginning, God said, Abraham, I choose you, not because you're great, because I love the world, and the world will be blessed through you and your descendants. That is amazing. See, people think that the God of the Old Testament is some angry, <laughs> judgeful God, and, and I know there are some passages in the Old Testament that are hard to explain. I get it. But the thing is that from the very beginning, God's plan has been to bless you and me, all people. Bless us through the descendants of Abram. God called out a special people, the Israelites, to reveal himself to the world, to be his hands and feet in the world around them. And they had a purpose in God's story. And, and then, right, it was a couple of generations after this, they went into 400 years of slavery. And they were like, what is going on? But then after that, you know, God sends Moses to rescue them and all that. And then he reaffirms this promise, this purpose in a different way. Look at what he says. He says in Exodus 19, to the Israelites, now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, basically, I love you if you love me back, if, if you act like my people, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me, this is the big one, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. A kingdom of priests. A whole people who would act as priests. Now, most of us, we've grown up in Catholic churches or other churches that have, you know, we've seen priests and, and we see this picture. But do you know what the definition of a priest is? The definition of a priest goes all the way back to these days. A priest is somebody who stands there in between God and the world. A priest is somebody who holds God's hand and holds the world's hand and unites them together. That's what a priest does. They stand, they, 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 they help connect God and people. What an amazing role. And God is saying, you Israelites, you are going to become a kingdom of priests. Your job, your purpose is to hold God's hand and hold the hand of the world and you unite them, bring them together. Be his hands and feet. Reveal God's purpose, his pursuit of the world. Show them that that is what is happening. And just like Adam and Eve, and just like you and me, they continually failed to do that. They became self-centered and prideful. They really began to believe that the story that they were living was the story about them. It was their story, their little story, their little story. Their one, the story that, no, that, that had no impact, that had no power. 
But that was the story that they, they were living. God was, but this is the beauty. God is always calling his people back, inviting and re-inviting us into his story to be his hands and feet to pursue the world. Now, I said it before, but I think we need to hear it again because I need to hear it again. No matter what you've done, no matter who you've become, God is pursuing you today, right where you are. God knows that we struggle, that, that, we, that we really struggle to believe in what we can't see. He knows that. I mean, he knows that the way we are, especially this, this separation that we have, that to believe in a God that we can't see is so difficult. He knows that. I think that's why he uses people to reveal himself. That's why we're called his hands and feet or the body of Christ because we are his physical presence. But this is what's so cool is his plan also included becoming physical himself. Do you know that hundreds of years before Jesus was born, God continually spoke through the prophets promising that he would send somebody, a Messiah, to reconcile the world to himself. Now, we're not going to read all these, but I just thought it was a powerful that when you look, just a quick overview of the different prophecies that happen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus. And we take him for granted that, you know, he was from David. He was born in Bethlehem. He was born of a virgin, for crying out loud. This was in Isaiah, like 600 years before Jesus was born. He was raised in Galilee. Nobody liked Galilee. That is crazy. That's like living in Illinois. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. But actually it was the way, you know, in Madison, we see signs that make fun of Illinois all the time. Illinois, Illinois, I don't know. Make fun of it all the time. And they make fun of the people who, who are, you know, tourists coming up north all the time. And I, I didn't even get it sometimes until somebody told me, oh, Wisconsin, maybe Madison, they don't like people from Illinois very much. That was the Galilee. Nobody liked the Galilee. And it said in scripture that he was going to be raised in Galilee. And people are like, why? What, would, what is that about? I don't think that part's God's word. Yeah, no. You know, that's what they would think. It says they will, he will attract people from all nations. And again, they'd go, why? We're the best. They, he would re be rejected by his own people, hands and feet pierced, heal the sick, free the captives. They were like, well, that's pretty cool. Bring justice to the poor. When they were poor, they loved that verse. <laughs> when they were not poor, they didn't like that verse very much. And so the Jewish people, they knew these scriptures. Man, they had them memorized. And their interpretation of these scriptures created this longing for an expected Messiah. And in God's typical way, nothing happened the way, the way they expected because they were expecting this Messiah to come. And, and, you know, they were being just put down by Rome. And they were just this little bitty place that nobody liked, that the Romans just kind of <coughs> despised. And, and they thought that the, the, the Messiah would come and conquer Rome. And, and, and he didn't. Instead, he came and he conquered sin and death. They, they thought that there was going to be this, uh, this, this Messiah who would take down I mean, the epic empire. But you know what he did? He unexpectedly healed a, Roman, healed a Roman officer's servant. And then he complimented his faith. What? Who does that? They expected a king to liberate Israel. But instead, they, they got a king who seemed to want to liberate all people. See, the greatest picture of God pursuing people was the coming of Jesus. Because it was revolutionary and it changed everything. God's plan all along was to become a human being, to become physical, so that he could pursue the world and offer reconciliation right here in our presence. And I tell you, if you go to Israel right now, you see Jesus' footprints, not literally footprints, but you see Jesus' influence everywhere. This stuff really happened. It's amazing. Jesus changed everything. God's plan all along was to save, to redeem, to restore broken people. Such a shock. Jesus was so unexpected. I mean, look at, let's look at a couple of things real quick that Jesus did. Because you, you think of Messiah, king, guy who's supposed to conquer Rome, and this is what he did instead. He ate with tax collectors and sinners. Now, tax collectors, they made people from Illinois look like they were from heaven because tax collectors were awful. Trade, and I'm joking. I, I realize how offensive this is. 
Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm so sorry. This is going to go on a tape, and people are going to go, who is this guy? Fire him now. I get it. All right. Um, but he ate with tax collectors and sinners. I mean, the worst of the worst. He revealed to the Samaritan woman. I mean, a Samaritan was like a puppy killer, you know? Um, Samaritans were terrible, terrible. Nobody liked the Samaritan. They just wanted to kill puppies and kittens all day long. And, and then you have the Samaritan woman who was at the well, who was rejected by everybody, and he is the first person that he actually says, I am the Messiah. He never had said that before. She gets it first. What? It was unexpected that he would allow a prostitute, a prostitute to pour perfume over his feet and wash them with her tears and hair. In the midst of a Pharisee's house, he was at a Pharisee's house for dinner. She comes in crying, tears on his feet, wipes him. I mean, she's touching him, and the Pharisees are like, you are letting her touch you? You're obviously not who you say you are because you would know what kind of lifestyle she was living, but he did. He came to the, the rescue of a woman who was threatened to be stoned because she was caught in the very act of adultery. He approached Thomas after he admitted his doubt. Everybody said, we saw Jesus, he rose from the dead. And Thomas says, I have to see him. I will not believe it until I put my hand in his side and put my hand in the wounds on his hands. And Jesus said, okay. And he did it. See, God is, God is a God who pursues no matter who you are or what you've done. He's a God of grace. He offers relationship. A relationship that neither of, none of us have earned. See, that's the kind of God we serve. He is the kind of God who pursues. The way a lover pursues his beloved, the way a, a, a groom pursues his bride, the way a father per, pursues his lost child. You know, when, when my daughter Riley was two, uh, we couldn't find her in the house. She's two. She was walking, and, but she was gone, and we scoured every inch of that house. We looked in closets. We looked in cabinets. We looked everywhere, and then we saw that the back door was open which freaked us out, as you can imagine. We started going through the neighborhood. We looked in the bushes. We had kids crawl in the drain pipes to see 10, 15 minutes go by. We do not find her. We had gotten the neighbors involved. Everybody is, you know, going around the neighborhood, yelling Riley's name. That 10 or 15 minutes felt like an eternity, as you can imagine. We couldn't find her. We really, we were getting to the point where we thought somebody took her. That, that was the only answer. Then all of a sudden, Allie over here, who was eight years old. She's like, I found her, I found her. And it was the greatest relief of my life. You see, when, when Riley heard us calling her name, she thought it would be cute to get in the car and duck down, shut the door. As we're walking, screaming, yelling, running her name, she's just giggling like, find me. <laughs> when we found her, we grabbed her, we hugged, we cried, because we had found our baby who was lost and then we wanted to kill her. <laughs> because I, I know that I'm going to die five years earlier than I would have had that situation not happened. But we would have given everything to find our little girl. See, that is the way God pursues us. We are desperately broken. We're lost. We don't, we don't even realize it. We're like the two-year-old who, who thinks they're just having fun and doing things their own way. But God is pursuing us, and he's done everything necessary for us to find him and to be right with him and to be one with him. And so it's our choice. See, we can choose to, be hot, to hide, or we can choose to be found. We can choose to focus on our story, or we can choose to participate in his story. God invites us to be reconciled with him. You know, we can say no and reject the offer, and so many of us do, and we go on with that deep-seated feeling that we're missing, that life's not the way it is. Take a survey around the world, and, and it is amazing how everybody knows that something is broken in the world, that it's not the way it should be. You know, we see famine, we see abuse, we see uh, sex slavery, we see all of these things, and we go, this is not the way it's supposed to be. The world is broken. And we feel this. We feel like, I, th I know I was made for something more. We're missing something, and we are, because we're not one. We're broken, and we're separate. We're other. And God is saying, you can be one. I've done everything it, it takes to be restored to oneness. So Jesus offers for us to follow him. And the question is, will you? Do you? Because I chose to follow Jesus when I was 15 years old. And I chose to follow Jesus this morning. 
again. I chose to follow him yesterday too and last night. And probably a week or two ago, I chose to live my own story for a little while. Got angry or did something stupid, I don't know. And then I chose to follow Jesus again. And I'm not talking salvation. I'm talking I ch- to be a part of his story, to participate in his story. He invites us to do that. So my question is, if you've never chosen to follow Jesus, he says, follow me, walk with me. It's time, let's do it. If you have chosen to follow Jesus, he always is saying the same thing. Follow me, come on. I've restored you. Walk in oneness. Don't walk in brokenness. Be a part of my story. Your story's little, but if you're part of my story, your story's huge. You can be a part of the big story. The Apostle Paul, he said, for God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. That's what he offers, and you can do that right now. So I want to pray with you. You know, some of us in here, we have never, I mean, a a crowd this size, it is statistically probable that there are people in here who have never chosen to follow Jesus. And you can do that today. And it is, forget statistically probable, it is guaranteed that every single person in this room gets to choose to follow Jesus again every moment, every day. Some of us in here, we know we've been living our own story. So would, would you pray with me? If you've never chosen to follow Jesus, I want to invite you to do that. If you have, I want to invite you to say yes to him again. Let's pray together. God, I want to thank you that you've done everything necessary for us to know you, to be one with you. And I know there, there are probably people in this room who've never chosen to follow you. You've been pursuing them. You have done everything necessary to make, make it possible for them to follow you. And you're just inviting them, waiting for them to say yes. And so, Father, I pray that you would give them courage to do that today. And and if you're in here, you can, it's not about words, it's about a heart, but you can just say in the quietness of your, your heart, God, I want to follow you. I know I am broken. I'm separate from you. I don't want to be anymore. I know you died on the cross so I can be right with you. And today I choose to say yes and follow you. And for the, for the rest of us, those who have done that, it's, it's saying, God, yes, I'm following you again. I want to be part of your story. You can do that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, before we, before we end, Give me just a minute more. I'm sorry. I know I'm over. Um, Reconciliation, being one, that's not the end. It actually gets even better because the relationship is the beginning of purpose. God has a purpose. It's not just about being one. It's about being one with meaning and purpose. The end of this verse says... Did I click it? Yes, I I did. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. We're made right. We're given a message of reconciliation. See, it says, God wants to use us as he pursues others to be his tangible presence. Look at this. It says, so we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we, we say to people, come back to God. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. See, we have purpose. And I'm not talking about going out with a tract and telling them, you need to follow Jesus. You need to follow Jesus. And that is not good, okay? That, telling people they need to follow Jesus when that's not being his hands and feet. Jesus never walked around and said, hey, you, stop sinning. Follow me or die. Hey, you. He wasn't like that. He befriended. He met needs. He invited people in a great journey. He invited people to be part of a big story. He was the physical, tangible presence of God in the world. And what's crazy is he invites us to be the same, the physical, tangible presence of God in the world. So we have a purpose. Since the days of Abraham, we have been a missionary community, God's hands and feet in the world, called to wear his body. So what I would ask is as we finish... Would you mind appeasing me? And if you mean it, 
would you say this prayer out loud with me? Because, and I'll read it for it, say that you know that what you're saying is, God, we are available to you to be used as your hands and feet as you pursue and redeem the world that you love and died for. God, help us be a community, a community, a family that will live together in love and selflessness. Before we sing, would you mind if we just said this prayer together? All right, I'll lead. This is an out loud thing, by the way. God, we are available to you to be used as your hands and feet as you pursue and redeem the world you love and died for. God, help us be a community that will live together in love and selflessness. Amen.